Well, thank you, everybody, for coming out this morning. We know it's a wet morning, and everybody just probably wanted to stay in bed and stay in the house, so we appreciate your efforts of coming out to make this day special for us and for our, our military. Well, once again, this year, we're honored to have Dr. Robert Smith with us. If you've been with us on our past military months, you've, you've heard Bob talk, and he's a wonderful speaker. Um, Bob's here with his wife, Karen. Thank you, Karen, for coming and keeping an eye on him and uh, keeping him keeping him like as your critic. Is she going to score you later and let you know how you did some? <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, Dr. Smith was born in Nebraska and attended Nebraska University where he majored in history. He has always had a love for history and in particular interest in military history. He comes from a military family, so that probably is a big part of that, I'm assuming. His father was a World War II vet and a career Air Force senior NCO. Prior to his return to academia and advanced degrees, Dr. Smith managed a family-operated business where he learned management and organizational skills. He returned to academia in 1998, attending Kansas State University, receiving a Master of Arts in Military History in 2004, and a PhD in Military History in December of 2008. Bob has co-authored a book on the history of Fort Riley and is the author of numerous other articles on military subjects. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Smith. Thank you, Doug. I have my notes. <laughs> anyway, this was so much fun to do this topic, and uh, I hope you enjoy it as much as I did in working on it. And uh, it's uh, you're going to see some really some weird stuff, and uh, the Ameri the inventiveness of the American uh, entrepreneur is just incredible, and so. This is going to be a talk, I could do about 15 of these talks uh, on all the different vehicles, but I'm going to keep, keep it between 19, well I lied a little bit, 1915 and 1945, show you just a few of the really strange vehicles that American entrepreneurs, inventors offered to the United States Army. So, let me get my clicker. Can everybody hear me all right? Oh, good, good. Okay. Okay, first of all, I want to talk about the tank because most of these vehicles are going to be classified as a tank. Tank was actually the brainchild of, I'm glad, we had a lot of soldiers in here and I'd probably start throwing things at me here, but it was the brainchild of the Royal Navy and a guy by the name of Winston Churchill who was, uh, uh, of the, uh, belonged to the Admiralty. And it was during World War I, and with the trenches in World War I, about 1915, there was a question about how to get across those, how to, how to go over the barbed wire and get into the trenches and actually break the stalemate. And so it was decided by Winston Churchill, and to keep this operational security, it was decided that they were going to cover this vehicle up, this experimental vehicle up, uh, with tarp, and also to keep it under wraps what are we going to call it? Well, we're fighting in the Middle East. Let's call it a tracked water carrier, a tank. And so they covered it with the canvas. And then in 1916, they unveiled the tank. And uh, the prototype here, this is actually from 1916, the Battle of the Somme. Probably around 60 of these were tested out at the Battle of the Somme in July, well, actually September of 1916. And what they found out is they were very unreliable. Uh, of the 60 that were used, only 20 made it to the first line of trenches. And after that, they seriously most broke down and they decided to pull it out of, out of combat and refine it. And so uh, what I bet you don't know, though, is that there are genders on tanks, and it was decided by the British that there would be both male and female tanks. A male tank, like this one, actually that's a female. Anybody know the difference? A male tank had a six pound cannon in the, in the sponsons on the side. A female tank had machine guns. And so it was whether or not you had a male or female tank. I think that gender illustration has gone away since then. But. So anyway, 
Uh, just to give you an idea, some of the tanks that were done uh, were actually produced because no one actually had an idea, a set idea of what a tank should look like. And so we had a number. These were all operational tanks. There was the French Chamond. It would actually cross the, uh, the uh, trenches rather well, as I've illustrated here. See that uh, it's doing a really good job of crossing a trench here. It had a uh, 75 millimeter gun in the front and had had a Hotchkiss machine gun in the back. Had a crew of about six in here. The other, the French Schneider here, which was actually the first uh, French tank, uh, saw combat in 1916 along with the, uh, the British, had a 75 millimeter gun in a Swanson on the side. Then we have something that really looks like a tank, and it's a FT-17, it was a two-man tank. Uh, around 3,600 of these were produced, and it seemed to be the most successful. And then we have the Land Cruiser, the original tank, and it went through from Mark I to Mark V, had a crew of eight, had a crew of eight. Uh, the only problem with this is they had no secure ventilation on this and so most of the crew would actually become asphyxiated as uh, they would drive across. All of these tanks had a top speed of, and we average it together, around six, five to six miles per hour. The final tank is called the Whippet and it actually was a British tank here that is not a turret, that's a fixed casement there uh, armed with machine guns. And it was considered a light tank and this was a little speedster had about 7.5 miles per hour. <laughs> so this is what they're working with. And so when the United States enters World War I, uh, our inventors get in the act and decide to create a, an American-made tank. Oh, I'd forgotten. The Germans got Only 20 of these were built. This is the A7. Had a crew of 18. Only 20 were built. They were such a monstrosity and gas hog uh, that the Germans actually saw no real use for these. It carried a uh, 57 millimeter cannon in the front and numerous machine guns. Uh, but the Germans actually, uh, during World War I, really didn't think there was much use for vehicles of this size. The automatic Land Cruiser Alligator, 1915. This was developed by both the British and the Americans together. There was a cooperation working on this here. And uh, it was the Bullock Company of Chicago, Illinois, that actually uh, produced the plans for this. And they were submitted to the British. Because in 1915, the United States hadn't entered the First World War. Now, it had six road wheels. And it had a four-cylinder, 100-horsepower 100 100 uh, engine running the Land Cruiser. Consisted of machine guns, light cannon, take your pick. You have a lot of little sponsons there in which you can put weapons. It had a top speed, an estimated top speed, because none of these were ever built, of around three miles per hour. On a real speedster. Uh, the United States, the American inventors, the Bullock, company tried to sell it to both the British and the French and they said no thank you and so but it's just an interesting interesting uh, uh, invention here 1917 though the United States has entered World War One and we have the gas electric Holt Holt tractor company actually produced this tank uh, it has a 10 wheel track 10-wheel track, uh, crew consisted of six. Engine was a four-cylinder, 90 horsepower. I think your lawnmowers probably have more horsepower than that now uh, to run this vehicle here. There were two General Electric track motors. So the electric track, would, the electric motor would operate the track. So you would shut one electric motor down to turn the tank and let the other one spin it around and then you would then re-engage the other track. It had a uh, 75 millimeter Vickers mountain gun and two uh, machine guns. Only one was produced and the Holt tractor company is now the Caterpillar 
tractor company. Never adopted by the United States Army. Oh, you're going to love this one. This is a marriage made in heaven. And this is, it produced a child. What do you do, and the Americans thought about this, what do you do if you take a Mark I male land cruiser and you marry it up to a French Renault 17 light tank? And what you end up with is the skeleton tank. You want it lightweight, but you want to keep the track, the treads and the track, the, uh, the lozenge uh, type track configuration. And what you do is you put a FT-17 body inside the skeleton. What are the benefits? You're making a lightweight vehicle that could probably move a little faster than in, uh, uh, tanks at that time. This was created by the Minnesota Pioneer Tractor Company. It had two Beaver four-cylinder gasoline engines producing 50 horsepower for each of the tracks. Maximum speed was five miles per hour overland, eight miles on the road. They put a box on the top and they fitted a 30 caliber machine gun. Consisted crew consisted of two, and it weighed nine tons, so considerably lighter. This is my favorite one. Ford, in 1918, gets into the tank business. And Henry Ford basically says that we've got a lot of off-the-shelf truck parts. Let's create a tank and uh, assist the United States. And so they created this this tank here, and they used the Van Dorn Ironworks out of Cleveland, Illinois, and they produced this tank and sold it as a lightweight vehicle. Very fast, lightweight vehicle. How fast? 80 mile, uh, eight miles per hour, had a range of 30 miles. Uh, was powered by two Model T engines, four-cylinder Model Ts. This is modern tank inventions or inventiveness in that engine, transmission, and fuel tank are located in the back of the vehicle. Armor plating was between 14 millimeter and 70, and it had a single 30 caliber located here, or it could also be a 37 millimeter uh, uh, mountain howitzer in there. Had a two-man crew. Never adopted. The 1919 Christie medium tank. Starting to look like tanks now here. It's actually, they're taking the FT-17 design and adding to it. And the Christie design is really interesting because, how many have heard of the Christie suspension system? Christie suspension system. Christie continually tried to sell his vehicles, and we'll see this through uh, this talk, to the United States Army. They never, never bought it. Christie, though, decided he would send his designs overseas, especially his suspension system on his armored vehicles. <coughs> Only one nation really thought it was interesting and usable, and they employed it, and the, that was the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union uh, created the BT-7 and the T-34 using a Christie system. And even yet today, tanks that are being used in the Ukraine, the T-54, the T-55 tanks, still employ a Christie suspension system. So uh, Christie had a couple of ideas, though, that were kind of really out of the box thinking. First of all, it has a s small set of road wheels here center with two uh, larger uh, uh, bogies here operating the tracks. The interesting thing about the Christie suspension system is you could take the tracks off this vehicle and run it on the road. And then when you got into uh, rougher terrain, difficult terrain, you'd get out of the tank, pull the tracks off the upper deck, 
and you'd put the tracks on the tank. And I've talked to tankers here in my time uh, working at the uh, Fort Riley Museums and talking to tankers, and they said, do you realize what that entails? And so uh, it's, it's an incredible job, uh, a lot of time uh, uh, to put those tracks on, and so it was really an idea that looked good on paper, but never, never uh, actually found favor with the United States Army. Okay, so the hull is a boxy structure. It's something that we're going to learn in the interwar period is that the boxy structures uh, aren't the greatest for uh, protection. You want to have an angled armor like a 45 or 36 uh, degree angle on your armor. Uh, helps keep rounds off. It mounts a 57 millimeter cannon. The horsepower is actually moving up. 120 horsepower water-cooled engine. Uh, the armor is also getting thicker, between one inch and a quarter of an inch, and we're getting our speeds up. We're now up to seven miles per hour, and you have a weight of about 13.5 tons with a crew of three. I want to talk a little bit about this. In 1920, at the end of World War I, the United States Congress got involved, and there was some inner interagency or interbranch rivalry within the United States Army. We have the nascent, the new tank guys, which are infantry, are basically they're still in the infantry, and you have the cavalry guys, and they're fighting it out. And so in the 1920, it mandated that armored vehicles be the sole responsibility of the infantry. I'm going to go into that in a little more detail here in a second. Well, the infantry branch says, hey, we like this idea. You know, we're the only ones that are going to get armored vehicles, and those armored vehicles are going to be developed for the United States infantry. But the cavalry guys got involved and said, wait a minute. You know, the future maybe is armored vehicles. What are we going to do about that? And so it was decided, and this is a name game, that the cavalry actually bypassed the 1920 Defense Act regulations by calling armored vehicles tracked or wheeled as combat cars. And so it's just a name change. They changed the name. There's a lot of argument going on in World War I, uh, at the end of World War I, by military thinkers. And that thinkers, those thinkers are, do we want a fast tank that can penetrate enemy lines? and do all kinds of damage uh, in the rear areas? Or do we want an infantry support vehicle? And so there's two, two uh, levels of thought there that are going on, not only in the United States Army, but actually in the British Army. And so there are two types of tanks that are actually thought to be developed. There's the cruiser tank. And the cruiser tank is supposed to be that fast tank that actually penetrates the enemy lines and then creates all kinds of chaos uh, in the rear areas. And then there is the infantry tank, which is infantry support. They're the ones that are marching along with the infantry, and they're busting that hole for those cruiser tanks. And so you have both infantry, uh, uh, what are called support vehicles, and then you have the cruiser tank. And this actually uh, stays with Great Britain through the entire Second World War, because you have two types of tanks. You've got a slow tank with heavy armament that can actually bust through the infantry lines, and then you have the cruiser tank, which is a lot lighter, less well-armed, uh, that's speedy and getting behind the enemy. So basically, you have this. So what happens is in the infantry, uh, uh, law of 1920, or the, uh, the defense law of 1920, you have two separate spheres of armored vehicles being developed by the United States Army. The only thing is, is they're playing a name game with it. So, what do we have? We have the Knox light tank. And this is an automobile designer who is much influenced by the FT-17 uh, that was used in American service. And so he was going to produce a tank, this is really a high bar, a reliable engine with a little bit more firepower. The 37 millimeters used, and there's a coaxial. This is the first time we decide a coaxial, a machine gun next to that 37 millimeter main armament. 
And so this is going to be located in a turret. Here's a Cunningham 110 gasoline engine. And it produces a top speed of around 17 miles per hour. The armor, around 16 millimeter. You've got four of them being tested in 1928. It proved very reliable. And it was continually improved. Improvement up to a speed of 20 miles per hour. Starting to look like what we think are tanks today. The cavalry says, oh wait, we want an armored vehicle too. So we're going to create the combat car. They're going to create a combat car. And this is the T5 combat car. Uh, and it was unveiled in 1934 at Aberdeen Proving Grounds. And I want to direct your attention to the top. The main armament are machine guns, and they're located in two co-located turrets. You've got two separate turrets there. The vehicle also used a repurposed aircraft engine. And so this is a 250 horsepower Continental gasoline engine, has a top road speed of around 36 miles per hour, weighs eight and a half tons, and the armament consists of four 7.62 machine guns. This design here actually morphed into this design, which led to the M2 development, which is a 37 millimeter machine gun here, and two side sponsons here with machine guns on either side. And this was one of the Army's first modern tanks that was available to the United States Army in the late 1930s, at the very beginning of the war in Europe. The Tucker Tiger Tank. Armored car of 1938. Yes, the Tucker, as you see out here, the Tucker Automobile Company is involved in this. Tucker wanted to create a fast-moving 4x4 armored car. And so he joined with the designers Henry Miller Wesley Kaysen, and they developed this prototype, the American Armament Company of Railway, New Jersey. Tucker at that time, though, was producing for the Army turrets for aircraft. And as you can see, here is the plexiglass turret here in the top. And so uh, the Tucker was actually this vehicle was pow uh, powered by a V12 engine, and it could achieve about 112 miles per hour on the road. And it was actually believed uh, that this 37 millimeter automatic cannon could actually drive so fast with the armament that it had could chase aircraft. I don't know how that's possible, but it's, it was how it was sold. Uh, Tucker took it to the Army. The Army said, no, thank you. Uh, we have other vehicles in the works. So they took it to the Dutch in the late 1930s. And the Dutch said, no, thank you. Great idea, but no, thank you. I want to talk about the M6 heavy tank of 1940. Now, there's a little bit of a background here. In the 1930s, the Germans, the British, and the uh, Russians were all uh, in the mood for creating a monster tank, a multi-turreted monster tank. And we have here a series of tanks I'd like to point out. This is the British entry into it. This is the Vickers heavy tank. Uh, it has uh, basically a, uh, uh, that, a 37 millimeter cannon or two pound cannon there in the turret and then in a second turret here located further down on the hull you have a 25 millimeter gun and then you have over here a machine gun in a separate sponson. The Russians created this monster here and this monster has a uh, 57 millimeter main gun and numerous Maxim or Vickers machine guns in separate turrets. The final 
and I can't even, I'm not even going to try and pronounce the, this German, uh, this name. I actually wrote it down. New Bafranzug heavy tank. That's right here. And only about five or six were produced, and they were so large and so fuel, uh, uh, gluttony on fuel, uh, that the German army very quickly dispensed with them, going with the Mark III's and Mark IV's, the time period. Now, the Germans didn't get done with heavy tanks, because they were enamored with heavy tanks, uh, creating the Tiger in 1942, uh, and then the Tiger II, the, what we call the King Tiger, Tiger in 1943. Uh, and then on the books in 1944 was the Maus. And the Maus was probably the largest tank ever developed, uh, ever developed and ever uh, uh, designed. But the United States decided, well, we're going to create a heavy tank. And this is in 1940. And so one design in 1940 was the M6. And it consisted of a multi-turreted vehicle mounting 75 millimeter, 37 millimeter, 20 millimeter. And this was a really big design in the 1930s. But by 1940, it was decided that this was uh, going to be dropped because the M6 heavy tank here was developed. And so the Army continued to design this prototype. And December of 41, it was delivered to the Army for testing and evaluation. Now, the problem was is they had the big enough engine, but they didn't have a transmission that would actually be able to handle this size of tank. It was very difficult, and so they worked back and forth between a hydraulic transmission or a torque converter. And so from 41 to 42, they built three prototypes. They put one with a torque converter, uh, and they added uh, one with an electric, uh, built one with an electric uh, transmission. The Army was looking at it very seriously, but then it decided. And if you'll notice, does anyone look? Does that look familiar? Sherman. Sherman. Yes, the, the Army decided we've got a Sherman. It's a very uh, reliable tank. Uh, we can produce a lot of those. Why spend the time and money to develop this tank, which probably uh, would not operate very well uh, in the uh, environment? The crew was of six, had numerous, numerous weaponry. It had a uh, maximum speed of 22 miles per hour. It had that right G200 nine-cylinder gasoline engine, 850 horsepower. Now remember when I started just about 20 years before talking about tank design and it was 50 horsepower? Now we're at uh, uh, an incredible, uh, incredible increase in horsepower. Of these, 40 were produced. 40 were produced and none ever left the United States. It was just too big. We created the T-26 in 1944-45 and only a few, that's the Pershing tank, uh, only a few of those were actually produced and sent overseas. The problem with the the Pershing tank at the very end of the war in Europe is uh, we found that a lot of European bridges could not support its weight. And therefore, and I think there was only one action in which a Tiger faced off with a uh, T-26 in 1945. There's a really cool video on it. So the conclusion, well, between 1917-45, and I actually gave you, just skimmed the top here. There's hundreds of designs. You just If you Google it, you'll be amazed. Uh, many were fanciful, never produced. This is my favorite. This is the Russian flying tank that was actually developed during the Second World War. Uh, it has a Russian light tank on it, though. But uh, it's really interesting. The two things that I found most interesting in preparing this for for the museum here, Doug, is the amount of car manufacturers that really get involved in doing uh, development, tank development, especially during the interwar periods and then during the Second World War. More research, 
more strange designs. And I actually found one, a Russian tank that was developed in 1916. Uh, that's about three stories tall. Uh, and so more to follow on this, but it was really great to do this. I had a lot of fun doing it. And if you have any questions, uh, I'll tell you what I know about tank design and development. And if I don't know the answer, I'll sound very uh, expert and make something up. <laughs> well, thank you all. I hope you found it as much fun as I did in putting this together, because there's, there's some really strange vehicles out there that never saw the light of day.